The concept of God was not a thing for me growing up. You reverted to Islam not too long ago. Alhamdulillah. What kind of questions are you asking? What kind of answers are you finding? When I really, really started taking it serious was I made a decision that I, I regretted a lot. He'd always say that like in Islam, when you go through a hard time, it's because Allah is trying to like guide you or show you something or teach you something. It's the feeling that changes everything for you. I didn't want it to be a phase that I was going through. I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to do this, it's because I want to dedicate the rest of my life to become the best Muslim that I can possibly become. I was scared to tell my, my parents and I wasn't going to. What are you expecting her reaction to be? One of my biggest worries was that she tried her hardest to teach me Buddhism. So I was afraid that I was going to break her heart. How do you start the conversation, if you don't mind me asking? And I told him, today I'm going to become a Muslim. And it was silent for a little bit. What has been the hardest adjust adjustment to your lifestyle since you became a Muslim? Like, I'm getting, like, emotional, like, saying this right now. But, like... Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day and giving this podcast a listen. And I also wanted to remind you that the only way this podcast will ever grow is with your support and with your help. So subscribe to the podcast, like this video, and now let's get the show started. Welcome aboard Middle East Airlines. <laughs> Shoda, how are you? Doing good, brother. Thank you. How are you? Good, okay, alhamdulillah. Um, Shoda, uh, you're the first non Middle Eastern person that is on, not from here but you're not from here so it makes all the sense in the world um so the way i usually started off is just by you introducing yourself in a very self-reflective manner if you want to call it like i tell people if you would look in the mirror who do you see man already it's like a deep question um well you know, I'm, you know, my name is Shoda. Like, I grew up in a lot of different places. Um, so I don't really have, like, a home place, uh, which is, like, weird sometimes. Uh, I mean, Japan would always be home for me because I have family there. But when it comes to, like, stateside, like, I don't really have, like, a home here. Um, but when I look into the mirror, I think over the years it's changed. You know, I've always tried to see how I can become a better person. I wasn't always like this, mm -hmm. but recently at least I've been trying to always become somebody who's constantly improving themselves and becoming a better person towards other people. Mm. Um, and it's just a constant journey of growth. Yeah. So how did you end up here? You mentioned that you're from Japan. You mentioned that you lived in so many different places. So take me back to like the beginning of that moving out of Japan story coming into here. Like moving to Michigan? Yes, sir. First of all, I never thought that I would ever live in Michigan. Really? You know, out of all the states that I could have moved to, like Michigan was definitely not on the top at all. Um, you know, I always thought it would be Florida or like California, maybe even Vegas. But how I got here actually was... Um, I mean, it's a, it's, it can turn into a long story, but say it all. Okay. So when I, when I started going to high school, my freshman year of high school is when I moved to Japan mm. and I went to uh, a military school there. So you were born here? No. So, so we'll, we'll take it back a little bit. So I was born in Japan. Okay. Um, my dad was in the military. My mom was Japanese and that's how they met because okay. he was stationed in Japan. Okay. So that's how they met on, um, it was a, a Navy base, Yokosuka. Okay. Um, so they met there. So I was born there. But right after I was born, we moved to the States, Indiana. Mm. But growing up, every summer, my parents would take me back to Japan to try to uh, instill that, like, Japanese culture in me, to learn Japanese. Um, my mom always wanted to go back. Uh, so we always went back to Japan almost every year. So growing up, it was very confusing for me, I remember. Not knowing... The difference between the Japanese culture and the English culture yeah. or the American culture to the point where it was also hard for me to make friends because we were moving so much and when I was little it was very hard for me to remember faces mm. because it sounds a little racist but you know like when I go to Japan everyone looks the same right 
But when I went to the States, everyone looked the same. Okay. So it was hard for me to like remember faces, which made it hard for me to make friends because I remember when I was little, I would try so hard to remember someone's face and name. But then the next day I'll come back and I just forget it. That's I don't so remember what they look like. I don't remember what the name was. So it was hard for me growing up. Yeah. So that was like a struggle I had when I was like, you know, kindergarten, like all that. But so growing up just back and forth, a lot of back and forth. Um, middle school, I moved to Germany, lived in Germany for four years. So it was like fifth to eighth grade, I think was in Germany. Really? Yeah. And then freshman year of high school, moved to Japan. So when we live in these different countries, it's on a military base, a U.S. military base. Mm -hmm. So the environment is very Americanized. Okay. But as soon as you leave the base, you're just, you know, you're in that country. So it's different. But so I lived in Japan. Did you leave the base often? When you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can leave whenever you want. You just have a military card to mm -hmm. get that gives you access to get back on. But they try to make it really um, convenient for you. So you don't have to leave if you don't need to. But you know, you're living in a different country, so it's nice to leave and, you know, enjoy the culture, especially in Germany. Germany was really nice. We loved going out during the winter because the Christmas markets would be really nice. And my oh, yeah. mom loved it. And, you know, you would be eating uh, like German food all the time. So that was really fun, especially growing up, like being able to uh, experience all the different cultures. Also, like when you live in Germany, it's like in the middle of europe almost so you can drive any direction and then go visit a different country yeah so we got to do all of that which is really nice and when we moved to japan uh i lived there for three years so freshman sophomore junior year i would say one of my, like some of my best years like i made lifelong friends there mm. um to this day we still talk so I, I had a lot of great experiences there learned a lot about myself you know just growing up and then senior year of high school I we moved to New York and okay. this was my first time I think being a little older that I went to a school that wasn't a military school okay. like it wasn't on a military base because my dad retired so it was my first time going to a public s school that I can remember of and that was like a culture shock for me because when you're on a military environment like everyone um has benefit you know military benefits mm -hmm. you know there's not like a huge difference in like classes okay you know but when I went to a public school, it was the first time experiencing people who are very, very low class, like low income. Mm. But then there are also people who are very, very rich. And seeing that was kind of like, it was amusing to me. It was like something new for me. And it was like a shock because... Where did you kind of land on that high to low? Fortunately, we were always like middle. Okay. So... um we never really had like a huge struggle. Okay. My parents were also, they were also very good with teaching us um, how to be hu like humble, you know? Um, it's not like, we, we never really struggled. Both my parents worked. Yeah. Um, and my dad always had a good job in the military. So the military really took care of us. So we all had the benefits, you know, like the housing was covered, medical mm -hmm. was covered. Um, you know, all, a lot of the bills were covered, so we never really, like, had a struggle. But when I moved to New York, that's why, like, it was such a shock for me when I would see, like, there are actually, like, poor people, and then there's yeah. actually, like, really, really rich people. And that you're saying this is senior. You're kind of old at this point. Yeah, yeah. So it was really weird for me, you know? And I was at the age where I can, like, really understand it. So that's why, um, I, like... When I moved there, like, I was making friends, too, and then there were, like, some, some friends were really rich, some yeah. friends were really poor, but that's why, like, I got to see it firsthand, and when I was experiencing it, it was just such a weird thing for me, like, I just didn't, I just never experienced that growing up, so it was, like, really weird, you know? You know, living in all these places, um, before, like, we got to, how do you got to Michigan, but what do you think still pulled you more to Japan, although you said... I mean, you used to visit often, right? but I mean, a bulk of your life, it seems like it was here, a little bit in Europe. So what do you think like pulled you more to Japan? Like, I, I'm, because I think out of assumption, it's the culture there. It's very appealing, but it's very foreign to me, at least. I don't know anything about it. So what's like some things about the Japanese culture that you that you now living in the States be like, man, I wish these guys had this here. Or had this aspect of the culture here man 
So I, I think um, I lived a third of my life in the States, a third of my life um, in Japan. Mm-hmm. And no, actually, it's like half and half, actually. And then there's Germany for four years, yeah. but I'm not including that. Um, but what's so nice about Japan is like the culture. It's so there's so many things you can do. Like I lived in Tokyo. Okay. So it's like in the in the heart of the city, you know. So there's so many things that you can do and you're never bored because you can travel to a different little city inside Tokyo like every day. And there's just something you want to do. Like okay. whatever hobbies you have, you can find it in Japan. You can find it in Tokyo. So that was something I really liked. And something about the Japanese culture that is that everybody is super respectful. Mm. You know, obviously you have your like, you know, your your mean people, but um, everyone's super respectful. Everyone's uh peaceful quiet they keep to themselves nobody's obnoxious and you know loud or rude or anything like that um and what i also also really really love about japan is the food Mm. the food is amazing really yeah and to answer your question that if uh, like something i wish the states had that they don't and that japan has bro it's their 7-eleven 7-Eleven in Japan. All I see is the, the, of Japan 7-Elevens is on TikTok, and it really looks fantastic. Bro, they're amazing. Some are even bougie. Like, that's how nice it is. Like, when I lived there for two years after I graduated high school and went back and worked there full-time, I ate 7-Eleven almost every day. Really? Like, that's how good it is. And it's, like, it's affordable. It's good quality food. It's very clean and nice. Like, it's, it's delicious. No, like, Tokyo's on the bucket list for yeah, sure. Yeah, no, hundred percent. They have convenience stores, so they have so many different um seven eleven type stores. Mm-hmm. They have being uh these places called like Family Mart, Lawson. Like you can go to any one of them and just live off of it every day. And that's what I was doing when I lived there. That's so cool. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool. So to like get back to like how I got to here, right? Yeah. Um, so senior year of high school, I moved to Lockport, New York. Mm-hmm. Never heard of this place ever. Honestly, the people there were cool, but I hated the place. Okay. So I really wanted to get out of there quick. It's pretty boring here now that you, you talk about here that. or like states states. You think so? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it depends what you like to do, mm-hmm. but for the most part, you talk about Japan being, uh, or Tokyo being a city where like, there's a million things you can do. And I think of Beirut and Lebanon, same exact thing. There's a, like you cannot be bored. Right. And then here you find yourself being bored all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's a little different yeah. for sure. Yeah. But what I love about Dearborn um, is the people. Yeah, yeah. Like for there's sure. always something to do. Yeah, you know? no, absolutely. Yeah. So you get to Lockport, New York. Yep. So I go there my last year of high school, played sports. Um, and I made some like life changing decisions while I was there that led me to like getting into this creative industry. What kind? So changing decisions. Yeah. So growing up, I always play sports. Mm -hmm. I was like a sports shot growing up. Really? Yeah. Like my mom got me into sports and she kept me into sports. Um, She thought it would be like a good way of teaching me discipline and um, like a lot of good lessons in life, you know, how to lose, how to work hard. So so my dad, too. Mm. Um, So I, I was just always sports, 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 outdoor kid. But when I played football in New York, man, like it made me hate the sport so much because my team was terrible and my coach was terrible. And, um, it was like, it was my first time experiencing this too. Like when I, when when I became stateside, the amount of people that were just always on drugs Mm. and just didn't care about sports and they thought they were too cool to work hard. I had that on my team and these were actually some of the, most athletic people that we had and they were the best players but they just always came late to practice they were always high and i'm just like bro like what is this was it a shock to you playing sports all your life Uh, and then you moved to this place where well it's kind of like it was disappointing because it was like bro like you're so talented if you took it serious you can actually go somewhere with this Mm -hmm. like for me like i wasn't always like i wasn't naturally talented like they were i had to work really hard to get to where i was so when i would see that i'm like bro like you're wasting a lot but you know it wasn't you know, it's not my life or anything. So I was like, it's whatever. So I just finished the season. And instead of playing basketball that year, which like I always did, I decided to do the high school musical. Okay. Dude, this was like a huge thing for me because one, I'm shy. And two, drama class and the musical was always like things that, you know, it's like yeah. for me, it was just like not cool to do. That's how I thought growing up. Yeah. Right. But I was like, you know what? Screw it. Let me try it. 
um i think it'll be fun it's something new so i did it i almost didn't do it because the auditions were coming and i almost just walked away because i was like bro screw this i'm not singing yeah. in front of people you know but you know i had some friends that convinced me to stay so i did it and i tried it out and actually enjoyed it a lot it was like a different experience for me it was new and what made me enjoy it was the artistic, like having fun being artistic and creative, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of like what the musical is. It's like you're singing, you're dancing, you're moving around, you're acting. And it was like, you know, it's creative. It's That's your introduction to the creative market. I would say so, I think. That's when it opened up my eyes that it's like, bro, like just step out of my comfort zone. And there's so many, there's so much more to life that I can learn and like mm. experience. That's actually fun. So, cause I was always closed minded when I was growing up. That's yeah. why it was just sports, but I tried it out and it opened up my mind. And that's when I was like, well, what else can I do? And then it was my senior year of high school too. So I was like, I really got to figure out what I want to do. Do I want to go to college? If I go to college, what do I want to study? And at that time, since I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college, I was just going to join the military. You know, my oh, dad really? was in the military my yeah. whole life. So for me, all my friends, you know, a lot of my friends were thinking about joining the military. So for me, it was just like a normal thing to like, it was just natural for me to think that too. Mm. So I was really going to join the military. But then I was like thinking about it. I was like the one life that I was given, do I really want to spend the next 20 years serving the military? And I think it's a great career. Like um, from what I've seen with, like, with my dad, like it's amazing. The benefits you get are amazing. And it's a really good life because you get to travel a lot. Yeah. But I was like, do I want to do that? And I was like, if I don't want to do that, what do I want to do? And at the time, I was watching a movie almost every single night. I just loved watching movies every single night. So I'm like, you know what? It'd be really cool to be able to make my own movie one day. Mm. Doesn't have to be a crazy movie, but like if I can learn how to a do movie. That, a movie, you know? I think that would be really cool. So for Christmas, I asked my parents to buy me a camera. Mm. So they got me this bundle kit. You know, it comes with two lenses. I forgot. It was a Canon camera. I forgot which one exactly, but it was, I think it was like a T6. Very like starter camera, mm -hmm. you know, it was a camera kit. So I started just going out and taking photos all the time. And uh, I started making friends through photography. And these people actually taught me a lot how to use the camera, how to be creative, how to edit. And through that, I met a uh, boxing promoter. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, promoting his own boxing events. Okay. And he needed recap videos made for them. So I started working for his events a couple of times I, I think like two or three times i worked at his events making recap videos and photos and whatnot and he was the connection that i made in order for me to come back to the states to move to michigan mm. because after i graduated high school in lockport um man there's so much that i'm missing but so after i gradu graduated high school in lockport i moved to florida for a year okay but then i moved back i was trying to figure out what to do with my life Moved and back then, to New York? Yeah, moved back to New York with my parents. And and then I moved to Japan because my mom got me a job there. Mm. So Was that like at all something that you would think, okay, I really like Japan more than here. I'll probably just move back there and work there. Or so was that not an option for you? So um, what's crazy is that like I actually didn't want to move to Japan. How come? Because my japanese i wasn't confident in it mm. like i can understand it i can communicate but it wasn't like on a professional level to where okay. i can like i didn't think i could work inside a company and like be comfortable speaking it that much but you know i did move back to Jap uh back to new york after living in florida right? i was trying to make it in florida it just didn't work out at all like it was i was struggling so i moved back to uh, new york to try to like reset and figure out what to do and then my mom asked me if I wanted to apply to some jobs in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I said no, because I was going to go there to visit my grandparents. Yeah. So she said, while you're there, why don't you just do some interviews? I'm like, no, I don't want to. She was like, well, if I apply to these jobs for you and then you get some, will you go for me? Like, just do it as a favor for me. So I'm like, you know what? If you do all the work. She really wanted you to go live there. Right? Oh, my God. Like, she's the best. Like, without her, I would not be where I am right now mm. because I, I was so lazy and I, I didn't want to do any of that. But she agreed. We made a deal that if she were to do all that for me, that I would just show up to the interviews. Mm -hmm. I would just show up. You know, I don't have to get any jobs. I just show up. So she actually she actually got me five interviews. Wow. <laughs> while I was there. So I went to them and I think it was the fifth one, fourth or fifth one. I like walked into the room. I met the people and I instantly knew like when I started talking to them, I'm like, 
if I were to move to Japan, it'd be here. Like this would be the company that I want to work yeah. with. Um, what kind of company was it? Man, so they were they were like still new. They were very brand new. They only had like nine employees. They were a small company. What do they do? Um, they do uh, like SEO and oh, okay. um, stuff like that. But they were just starting out their video production company. Oh. And they only had one video, uh, one one videographer and one photographer. So it was in the creative space. Mm -hmm. So so your parents were on board with you being a creative. It wasn't one of those two where, uh, I think I mean personally, uh, th when I said I wanted to get into uh, like being a creative, it wasn't really like that exciting for my parents to hear. You know, yeah. it's it never is. Yeah, <laughs> because it's 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 supposed to be a hobby, right? Right. You take right. pictures on the celebrations that the family has, right? And when we're on trips, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. But saying like you want to go out and make money out of it is not really uh yeah your no, best. My mom was she was bummed. She oh, was, she was sure. very upset. Um, and my dad, I don't know how he felt, but he told me whatever you decide to do, just make sure you put a hundred percent into it. Okay, that's so a good advice. He said he will support me with whatever decision mm -hmm. I make. Um, my mom was the one that was a little disappointed because she always wanted me to be a lawyer or a, a doctor. Of course. You know, you know, something where I go to college and get an education in. And so telling her was hard. Mm. But I told her straight up, this is my life. This is what I want to do. I want to take it serious. So the way she showed me support was by applying to those jobs. Yeah. You know, and then trying to get me into a full time job doing that. So I'm telling you, man, she changed my life. Because without her, like, I wouldn't have gotten those interviews and I wouldn't have met those people that I did in Japan who then also changed my life once I started working there. And You know, Shona, you're, you're saying all this stuff and I think, like, when I look at you and I'm like, Shona's my age, but now you say all these things and now I'm starting to think you're way older than me. No, I'm very, very grateful for how my life turned out, although I did struggle a lot, mm. like mentally, like mentally, I struggled a lot. Like but this stuff isn't too long ago then. No, it was two years ago that I moved That's here. That's nothing. Yeah, it was like just a little over two years ago that I moved here. So two years before that is when I started working in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And what's crazy is that like. How was I, working in Japan? Th th this is. um. I'm I'm a love talking about this because so when I went to that interview and in my mind I was like this is a cool spot like I would love to work here also because the videographer he spoke English mm. he lived in Cali for like six seven years and that's what made me very comfortable because if I didn't know anything I could just speak to him in English and mm. ask him questions in English so that's what helped and also the CEO there he was very very he had a young mind like he was he was open to like new things, which is very like rare in Japan mm. for CEOs to have an open mind to try new things. Are they more traditional? They're very traditional, very old school. Like they don't try new things in, in my opinion, from what I know. Um, but he was different. He like from all the interviews that I had. And what's also cool is that same night when I got home, the CEO calls me. He's like, Hey, like, would you love to work here? Or, or would you want to work here? And I'm like, yeah, I would love to. So he was like, great, like, where can you start? And, like, we started talking about that. And I called my mom right after. I was like, mom, like, I just got one of the jobs. Yeah. She's like, no way. She's, you know, very happy for me. And she was in the States at the time, so I was just calling. On every single goals list that we have, there's always a health-related goal. Goals like that usually need to be monitored and tracked around the clock because that's how you actually make a lifestyle change. Whoop is that fitness coach that is with you throughout the day and night, whether you're looking to improve your sleep track your workouts, or optimize your recovery, Whoop is designed to be worn 24-7. I personally never take mine off. But you don't have to take my word for it. Try it out for 30 days for free and see for yourself. All you have to do is go to join.whoop.com slash not from here, and that would be your first step towards actual change for your health. And now, let's get back to the show. So the first six months were smooth. But then it started getting to the point where it's like, okay, now I'm managing a project, like actually handling a client. Mm. And to now, okay, I can't do it by myself. So now I have somebody under me like that I'm doing it with. So I'm managing somebody now. Mm. And then like that one person turns into two, turns into three, four, or five. And I think at one point it became up to like six. And that I'm still like 21. Yeah. You know, it's my first time doing this. I don't know anything about managing people. And everybody's older than me. Yeah. Everybody under me it was like older than me and in japan culturally if somebody's older than you 
you have to respect you have to show respect mm. and it's not normal for a younger person to have some authority type of, like authority or leadership yeah over somebody who's young uh, older than them yeah so it's very like uncomfortable for me to like ask somebody to do this when they were older than me right luckily everybody like i said in japan is very respectful so um i just show them respect and they show me respect mm -hmm. back so that's what i liked about it. it made it a lot easier yeah but um like a year and a half into it it got so bad it got very tough mentally and to the point where i would have to step outside every single day to cry mm. like that's how bad it was because since i was working so much i didn't have time to see family my family was in the states so i didn't have any like close family near me and all of my friends even the friends that i had in japan i didn't have time to see them so i felt like i was just by myself were you telling your parents that no because i don't want them to worry mm. so i didn't tell them like how bad it was but it was so bad i would I was crying every day and I was managing a team too. So I couldn't show anybody that I was like going through it because as a leader, you can't show that you're miserable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise your team's going to be like, why am I working here? Yeah. You know, you want them to have fun and I wanted them to have fun. And I, I think they were, but it was very, very, very tough. And it got to the point where I never believed in depression until I looked it up and I'm like, I think I'm depressed. Mm. Like I was very, very depressed. And like, I never believed in it. I used to always believe us like, bro, don't say you're depressed. Like, just do something about it. Yeah. And I got to that point. I was like, I need to do something about this because I think I'm depressed. It was so bad to where even when I went home to try to sleep, I couldn't sleep. Okay. Like, I would just stay up all night long. And I'm like, okay, like, if I sleep now, I get three hours of sleep. That's good enough. You fried your body, basically. Yeah. The entire second year of living there. I, Yeah, bro. Like, I destroyed my body, my, my mentality. Um, like I did not get more than four hours of sleep for an, an entire year, probably. So do you call your parents and tell them I'm coming back? I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So how it happened was, um, I told them it, it just got to the, like to my breaking point. It just got to the point where I was like, I have to do something about this. So I asked my boss if I can have a month off, mm. like it was that bad. And taking a day off, one day off in that company was considered like, are you good, bro? Like, do you not care about this company? Yeah. That's how toxic it became. So I told him, I'm like, I'm either going to quit unless you can give me one month off. And he agreed. So for that one month, I decided to come back to the States. And I wanted to see all my friends here. And I wanted to, like, just do everything here. Just travel, eat, you know, just be back in the States and experience it and just be free. While I was here, I got invited by uh osp because mm. they were having their national conference in the summer and that was the year that they were having mike tyson and they asked me to come help film it because i had a friend who taught me how to do photography when i was in new york he was now working there and he was doing their conference and he asked me to just help him with it and i was like yeah sure so i did that and i met the company and uh while i was in the states i was offered a job by them yeah by them um he called me and asked if I'd be open to working at OSP and moving back to the States. And I just thought this is my opportunity to get out of that company and like change my life, you know, yeah. like do something different, do something new. So I was like, yes, absolutely. I'll do it. Whatever it takes, I'll move back to the States. So I come back to Japan and I instantly tell them I'm moving. Like I'm leaving here. I'll, I'll stay here for one more month, but I'm going to move back. Mm. And it was hard because, I mean, the two years when you're like with them 24 seven, you do build a relationship. Oh, with them, absolutely. You know? It's hard. Even if it was toxic, you know, you did. I did have a relationship with them. They were like family to me. We'd eat dinner every single night together. We sleep together. That's how it was. So um, it was heartbreaking when I told them, but I was like, I have to do this for myself. So I did that. And yeah, that's how I moved to. Did Michigan. you feel free when you finally got landed here? Oh, my God. Like when I came back for the one month to visit. I, I forgot how it was to be in the States and feel free. Like, mm. um, one of the stops I made was California. My best friend was living there at the time and we would just drive on the highway. And like, I looked to my right and left. It's just like an open field. Yeah. And like when I was living in Japan for two years, I was in the city yeah. where you look left and right and it's, it's just buildings. Yeah. It's just concrete, you know, like I rarely saw the sky. That's how it was. So when I got to see the sky, I got to see the sun, the trees and everything. I'm like, I missed this. Yeah. Like I felt free when that was happening, you know? So yeah, when I came back to the States, man, like m my depression went away instantly. 
like I felt free. I felt good. And I was like, man, I, I love the States. And that's how you landed in Michigan. Yeah. Out of all the States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never even heard about Dearborn until coming here. Really? Yeah. Never. How do you like it so far? Dude, changed my life. Really, I love huh? it so much. It's like, so to be honest with you, Michigan itself, I could care less. Yeah. But the people in Dearborn, that's what I fell in love with. The wow. community here. Like, bro, it's amazing. Is it close to the Japanese culture in a way to where, like, you still have that traditional sense that you have there? Uh, the family bonds because majority Arab. Uh, it, does that, you think that's what kind of pulled you? I think, um, no, I think the culture is a little different. Mm. Like Japan, like I said, they're very respectful, but they're very to themselves. Okay. So if you're going through something, it's not really a normal thing to talk about it with anybody, even yeah. your family members. Um, that's why I think it, it was hard for me when I was going through it because I didn't really have anybody to talk to about. Mm. But um, as nice as they are, when it comes to like caring for your neighbors or, you know, your family or, you know, even a stranger, I don't think anybody does it better than the community here. Mm. And that's what I fell in love with when I started seeing how people treated each other, whether they knew them or not. They were very respectful. They were kind, um, but they were also very giving. Mm. And that's what stood out to me a lot when I moved here. You reverted to Islam. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Uh, not too long ago. Nope. Three months ago. Three months ago. Yeah. And that's beautiful. And I've just... I was born into it, right? So to me, it's kind of second nature. I do not know anything before what my parents taught me about the religion. What was you just talked about how you struggled and how you did all these things and how you were fried mentally. When you're going through all these tough times, spiritually, where were you at? When I was in Japan? Yeah. Or like just before in general. So I wasn't spiritual at all okay. when I was going through all of that. And that's definitely something I know now that made it harder because I didn't know why I was going through it. Mm. Um, I didn't have any anybody to look to or anything to look to or anything to do about it. It was all just internal. And I'm just like, why? Like, yeah. how do I like, I don't know what to do right now. Like, I'm lost. I was so lost. Um. And then when I started opening up my mind and starting to like seek something, that's when I started to learn like every struggle you go through is for a reason and it's for a good reason. When do you realize that I like you're seeking something different? Like when does that change even like it's a spark and then it kind of right. builds off of that spark. But where does the spark happen? The spark happened when I moved here. Mm. I started going to... Um, uh, Wise Academy every Wednesday, the okay. spiritual gathering with Brother Hussein Sharara. Um, you just had him mm -hmm. on, on the podcast. Yeah. He helped me a lot when I first moved here because I moved here, I had a good job, it was with good people, but I was like homesick, you know, like it, it still doesn't make it easier. Like I'm by myself and I was struggling financially, like, like really bad. Why would you go to Wise Academy? Like, uh, it's a Muslim school. Right, right. Why would you go there in Some, the first place? So s somebody, very, I'm very fortunate to have met this person. He's one of my best friends now. He works at OSP. Okay. And he actually um, invited me to go with him. Mm. He brought it up. I forgot why he brought it up. I don't know if it was because maybe I said something that I was, like, struggling or something. But he asked me if I wanted to go with him because uh, it's a spiritual gathering. He's really good. He might be able to help. So I went there and instantly, like day one, I was like, I love this. Like, I want to come back again because he's very good at like opening up your mind to figuring out why you feel a certain way, mm -hmm. you know, and how to deal with it and how to change your perspective on life. And I needed that. And when I started going there, it didn't feel religious to me. You know, he's, it's, it was just spiritual. Mm -hmm. But he also tied it in with the religion and he did a really good job at that. So that's when it started making me ask more questions it's mm. like okay what are the possibilities when i start opening up my mind like what's possible in life and that's that's where it all started going to wise academy mm. and so then you could just keep going to these lectures let's just mm. call them 
and uh, what's going through your head? What kind of questions are you asking? What kind of answers are you sh are you finding? At first, it was a lot to do with like your ego and how um, being upset is just your ego, you know. And he was teaching how to deal with it and how to go th go through that and how to not feel upset about what other people do to you or um because it's a lot of times it's not nothing like personal a lot of times they're just going through something yeah so don't take it personal you know and then now you feel upset but it's like for what and that's something that really helped me in the beginning and then i, I remember i think there was a lecture where he talked about like finances too or like mm -hmm. money and how money is so like unimportant compared to like the relationships you have with your family and whatnot so that helped me a lot too because at the time like financially like i was really going through it um because i spent all my savings to move here you know and i didn't have a car i had to buy mm. a car i had a i didn't have a house or a place to live so i had to get an apartment i didn't have any things for my apartment so i had to get a bed i had to get kitchen supplies like so i really ran through my money that i saved up in japan when i first moved here so it got to the point where i had it's crazy i had 22 dollars in my bank account one time wow and I was like, man, this is wild. Like, I thought moving back to the States was an opportunity for me to, like, go up in life, mm. you know, like, to, you know, that next chapter. Right. But I'm like, I took a huge step back because the job in Japan I had where I was, you no, know, even if it was toxic, like, where I was in the company was really good. And financially, like, I wasn't doing too bad. So, like, when I came back and I was like, damn, $22 in my bank account. But I just started crying. I'm like, this wasn't what I was expecting, but you know, I just, I just sucked it up. I was like, I got to do something about it. Yeah. And that's when I started going to the lectures and it really helped a lot because it just took my mind off of like how much money I don't have. And then started focusing on developing myself and like seeking for something that's going to help me in the long run. Mm. And then one was that moment where you start getting introduced to Islam you said he ties it into Islam at the end or mm -hmm. religion. When do you start learning more about Islam? Or take is it, is it difficult taking that decision to even open up another religious book that maybe you never thought you would open before? I don't think it was difficult, because um, at this point I was at a I was like a point in my life where doing something that was like uncommon for myself. I started like enjoying doing new things, mm. you know? So this was like another thing. Um, I didn't grow up in the most religious family. Um, my mom taught me Buddhism as I was growing up, but I never seeked it myself. That was the thing I think made the difference. And even with Islam, nobody ever like forced it on me or um, tried to like shove it down my throat or anything. It was always like an invitation. It's like, hey, like, we're doing this. If you if wanna you want to come, if you want to come, you're more than welcome to. And you know, I was like, you know, I don't got anything to do. Let me go sit through it, like, see what it's about. That's what the lecture was. And then at the lecture, I meet somebody who teaches Quran classes. So she invited me, and I went to one of the classes, and I enjoyed it. And from there, I just kept on like learning more and more about it. A lot of my friends that I was making here were all Muslims. Mm -hmm. So I would just ask them from time to time questions that I would have. And it would always make sense to me. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I like that. And when I really, really started taking it serious was um, there was something that happened in my life to where I made a decision that I, I regretted a lot. And it didn't make me look like a it, it made me look like a bad person. And I hated that about myself because I, I was doing so good at like trying to develop myself and become a better person. And then. I screw it all up. It's just one little decision can mess it all up. Mm. And I was like, I need to find something. So you did me. something bad towards yourself, you mean? Or towards someone? Yeah, it was it was like towards myself, I would say. Um, it was just a very stupid decision okay. that I could have avoided. And um, it was just like the past self came back to me. And then mm. like it influenced me in a bad way. So I was like, I need to find something. And that's when... I started really like looking into the religion more seriously and I would ask questions almost every day at this point. Where do you where do you start asking questions like like what kind of questions would pop up in your head? Because 
like I said, I, I don't know what someone that does not know anything about the religion want to ask about. Like, what are the questions? Okay. Yeah, so I guess in the beginning, I mean, the questions will happen around the things that I would see in person first, which would be like prayers. Mm -hmm. So praying five times a day, I ask them, why do you do that? Like, what do you pray about? How do you pray? Um, another thing would be Ramadan. When my entire company would be fasting the entire day, I would ask them, why do you do that? Um, what's the point of it? Like, I was like, w why are you doing this? You know, and like everyone seems miserable yeah. <laughs> like throughout the day. But then they would explain to me like, you know, scientifically, there's a lot of benefits to fasting, which I didn't know too much about at the mm -hmm. time. And then secondly, it's like it's a it's a month to build that relationship with God and to become more spiritual and to practice self-discipline because you need that when you become a Muslim. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to be disciplined. And um, you also learn to sympathize for the less fortunate. Right. Right. So I loved every single part of that. You know, it's like everything I would hear. I just always loved mm. to the point where I even fasted during Ramadan. Like I didn't do the no beverages, yeah, like yeah. the no water thing, but at least food wise. Yeah. I tried to fast as long as they were fasting. And it was my first time ever fasting like that. So it was like it was a little hard. But I'm like, wow, you guys do this like every day for an entire month mm -hmm. almost. So it'd be things like that. And then whenever I'd go through a challenge or something in life, I'd call up my friend and I'm like, hey, like I'm going through this right now. And then he'd always say that like in Islam, this is what they teach us. It's like when you go through a hard time, it's because Allah is trying to like guide you or show you something or teach you something. And going through hard times only makes you a better and stronger person. You know, there's something you can get out of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, I love that. And every time I'd call him, he'd always make me feel better about what I'm going through. And um, something I, I learned recently that I really, really love is that when you ask Allah for something, he always has three responses. First one is, yes, I'll give it to you. Second one is, yes, but not now. And the third one is, no, because I have something better for you. Mm. Beautiful. Dude, I love that so <laughs> much. And it made me feel better about everything in life. It's like every time I wanted something, I would pray for it. I was like, I'm good. Like, I'm Just the good. concept that there is an entity outside of us that is, I don't even want to call it outside of us, like around us that basically everything we're doing is for our benefit as long as we believe that it's for our benefit, you exactly. know? Exactly, it's like your intentions. Yeah. yeah, like you know you're working so hard, you're doing all these things in life, but like something just, a block comes in the way and you either say like, man, like everything is ruined or be like, Oh, okay, this was just here because what I'm doing isn't what I'm supposed to do. Let me just turn to the side, open door here. Let me yeah. go through this one. Like you, you know? learn you learn that life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. Exactly. And that's what I that's what I really learned. And like the concept of God was not a thing for me growing up. I couldn't believe in it. I couldn't like understand it. Um for me a god was like this figure, right? Mm. That could just ha has all these powers. But when I first finally, finally like opened up to God, it was last summer. I think it was like June or July. I remember I was, I was driving. And so every morning I go to the gym and what I started to do to try to like practice opening up on the drive back, I would just talk to myself. I would mm. say, I'll go down a list of things that I'm grateful for. And then I'll also just, and at the time I still didn't believe in God, but I said, like, God, I'm grateful for this, 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 and that. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. You were not believing in God. You still thanked him. I didn't believe in it, but I practiced. Mm. I said it like as if I did because I wanted to. You know, I wanted to open up to God. I just couldn't. Like it was just, it was very uncomfortable. Were you on this religious journey in this in last summer? Like, I didn't think did I, it kind of start. I didn't the, think I knew I was. Okay. I think it was just something I was trying out mm -hmm. because I wanted to find something that can help me in life. What, was it before or after you went to the lecture? That first lecture. After. Okay. Lecture is where it all started. Okay. Um, and that was how long ago? I think I'd say like three months after I moved. I think it was like November of 2022. Okay. Yeah, two years ago. So in the summer you were practicing? Yeah. So a year and a half later mm -hmm. almost, I was practicing almost every day. Just like, God, I'm think you know, I'm very grateful for this, this and that. Just a list. And I would do that every day and I just practice it every day to the point where it's like it started turning into more conversations instead of just a list. You know, I would have a conversation and I still remember like one morning my chest 
the inside of my chest just opened up and I felt very warm. Like I'm getting like emotional, to- like saying this right now, but like when that happened, I was like, wow, this is God. Like I feel God's presence right now. And it was my first time ever like admitting that I believe in God and that there is something out there that is very powerful that we probably will never understand. We can only try our best, you know? But ever since that morning, I feel so different inside and I don't feel alone. What were you saying that morning? I think it was the same thing as always, but I think just one morning it just finally clicked and like I finally allowed him to come in, you know, and or he allowed it to happen, you know, and I was just like, wow, like this is what I was like missing in my life. Like I was like closed minded even up until that point. And when I finally just accepted it, I was like, dude, like it was such a crazy feeling for me. And I remember going to my friend who helped me throughout this journey. I was like, dude, like I felt this feeling this morning. Like, and I explained it to him and it was just like, it was such a happy moment for me. And my life has trained, it has changed drastically ever since. So you would consider that because I wanted to ask you like, what's like the piece of information that, that kind of told you, Oh, this is it. Like that changing point. And now I'm, because I don't know, and this makes more sense. So it's the feeling that changed everything for you. And you were like, I this felt is it. Mm. I didn't, I didn't choose to like, I wasn't one day like, okay, I'm going to be a Muslim. Like I wasn't like that. Mm. I did it very like step by step, just very little at a time. And all I did was just do research and just ask questions and everything that I would hear. I just liked it. So I just kept on like building, 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 just little, just little at a time. Cause it was, if you think about it, two years ago is when it sparked. So it right. took me almost a year and a half, two years mm-hmm. for me to finally make that decision. So th- it wasn't like it was just one little thing that like made that decision for me. It was just so many different things piled together and it just made sense for me. And it was the community I think was huge. Uh, huge. I would see how people would treat each other. And whenever somebody would do an act of kindness, they'd always say it's because of my religion. Mm. As a Muslim, I'm supposed to do this, this and that. So that's why I'm doing it. And I was always like, bro, that's beautiful. Like, I love that. You know, like everybody has good intentions for the most part, right? Mm. Good intentions to want to do something and give back. And I love that. And the, the closest people in my life here, like were all Muslims and the way that they would treat me, even though I wasn't a Muslim, I was like, man, you guys, you guys are like brothers, bro. And, even towards other Muslims, they're literally brothers and sisters. Like, and I love that part of it. And I think that's what made it so easy for me to like, keep looking into it because there was never anything that I would hear that I didn't like. Okay. Can you take me to the night before you take your Shahada or like when you make the decision, like I am going to take it, who do you call? Who do you talk to? How does, how do you kind of arrange that? So that was, uh, deciding to do that was a very, I think that might have been the hardest thing. Do you ask, like, how do I become a Muslim? And then just you just have to take your shahada? Yeah, I did ask. It's like when I take when I become a Muslim, like, what do I do? Do I just say I'm a Muslim now or like, is there something I got to do? And then my friend explained to me, yeah, you just repeat this phrase. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, you become a Muslim. I'm like, okay, like I can do that. But it was like the commitment was still something that I was afraid of because when I committed to it, I wanted to make sure that I was going to do it for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be a phase that I was going through. I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to do this, it's because I want to dedicate the rest of my life to become the best Muslim that I can possibly become. Right. So that commitment is very hard when you think about for the rest of your life, you're going to commit to something. And it's a lifestyle change. It's not like something you do once a week and then you're done. No, it's exactly. like every single day, every single hour. Exactly. But I started practicing it before I even became a Muslim. So, mm-hmm. you know, I cut out alcohol, I cut out drugs, I cut out everything that you're, you're supposed to cut out. But everything I cut out, it was just like it was helping me in life. Mm-hmm. You know, it just made me a better person. So I wasn't missing anything. So the night before i still remember so i took my shahada october 3rd so the night before or a week before is when i called all my friends or 
I called my best friend here. I told him I want to do it. And then I called my mentor. I told him I want to do it. Mentor here? Mentor here. He was the one that I met in Lockport who was promoting the boxing events. Okay. And now um, he, he was also one that brought me to Michigan. And he um, he's a Muslim and he taught me a lot too. He was one of the people I would always call and ask questions about. And he knew he knows a lot. So who do can you say his name? Amir. Okay. You you met him? Yeah. Yep. Amir Abdullah. Abdallah. Yep. He helped me so much. He was one of the people that helped me a lot. And um, so I I told him probably about a week before that I was like you know I'm thinking about like converting or reverting, you know. And they were so happy. And I called Amir because he lives um on the west coast mm. he does he's not he doesn't live in michigan oh, okay. so i called him i'm like hey i want to take my shahada but i want you to be there like because he was one of the first muslims i've ever met i want you to be there it'd mean a lot if you can make it and he's like brother there's nowhere else in the world i'd be than with you when you take your shahada and i was like man because like when i tell you this guy is probably the busiest person i know he is he's always in the Middle East or in the UK, like he's always traveling because of work. He's yeah. very busy. So when he said that he would drop everything and to like to make sure that he's here for that, I was like, that's that's my brother, you know? So we planned it to where he'd be able to make it. And my friend Hassan, who is the one that also helped me a lot, he was the one who introduced me to the spiritual gatherings, mm -hmm. the lectures. He brought up, why don't we do it? at wise academy you know that's where it all started and i can talk to brother hussein and see if we can make that happen yeah and i'm like you know what that would make sense like i would like that a lot and what's crazy is like when it happened when i was kind of planning it out in my head i wanted it to be like a small group right it's just a handful of people i didn't care about it being like this huge thing i just wanted it to be a handful of people that i cared about and that helped me throughout this journey because i wanted it to be intimate it turned out to be like 40 something, <laughs> almost 50 people, I think, in that room when I was taking my Shahada. And um, even even the night before, I was scared to tell my, my parents and I wasn't going to. And the reason was because I wanted to become a Muslim, start practicing it and then show them that I've changed. Mm. And I wanted them to ask me why I've changed. And then I was going to explain to them, well, I'm a Muslim now. And da, da, da. that's how I had it planned in my yeah. head, right? That's it's a cool like the, way it's to like do the, it. Well, it's like the easy way out. Yeah, I no, think. that's a cool way to do it, too. Yeah. But I met with Brother Hussein the night before. And he told me that he's the one who convinced me to at least tell my mom. Mm. He said, in Islam, your mother's blessing is one of the best blessings you can ever receive. So he, like, talked me into telling my mom. So the morning of... Before I go to the gym, I'm in my car and I call my mom and I tell her that, you know, what's going through your head, though, at that point? Like, I'm just hoping I don't break her. Heart. What's your expectation? Like, what are you expecting her reaction to be? And like, what's really worrying you? Uh, like, I think um, what what m one of my biggest worries was that she um, tried her hardest to teach me Buddhism. And took me to temples growing up and all this and all that, which I appreciate so much because it did help me become a better person. Like it taught me the the value of, you know, treating people with kindness and being nice to others. So there was a lot that I learned from it. So I was afraid that I was going to break her heart that I decided to go a different route than the one that she was trying to teach me. Mm. Um, but we have a relationship to where we're like best friends. So I knew I could talk to her about it and she wouldn't judge me. So I told her. And how do you start the conversation, if you don't mind me asking? I think I opened it with explaining to her how my life has changed after moving here and after meeting the people that I've met here and everybody is a Muslim. And I started like, I told her, I, I think I told her I started practicing some of the things and it's mm. helped me become a lot better, like a lot better person. And I told her that tonight I plan on, you know, reverting to a Muslim, becoming a like a legit Muslim and then she was like she didn't seem heartbroken she was like okay like you sure you want to do that and I'm like I'm, I'm very sure that I want to do this and she was like okay and she's like have you told your dad and I'm like no I'm not going to and she was like Shoda promise me that you'll tell your dad before you do it please that's all I ask yeah you know I don't care that you're gonna do this just tell your dad and I was like damn it I was trying to avoid why were that. you so worried from telling your dad 
you know like he's he's not here right he's not he's yeah. not here but so there's no way to for him to stop you doing it really if you have your mind set on doing it right right so my thing was that regardless of how my parents reacted i was going to do this right it was just the love that i have for them and mm. i didn't want to break anybody's hearts or because my dad grew up in a christian family mm. he was in the military he went to the middle east a couple of times you know to afghanistan and experienced some things you know and in his mind he's fighting muslims over there yeah you know they're not the good ones you know it's like they don't represent islam in a good way right but you know in his mind i think that's the image he had and i don't want to speak for him i mean he's he's, he's also very open-minded mm. um so I was afraid of that because he had that experience in the Middle East and I had no idea how he was going to take it. Um, but when I told him. So you did call him. I did call him. I called him right after I called my mom. So I called him and I told him I kind of like opened it up the same way I did it with my mom. I told him how my life has changed meeting these Muslims over here and da 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 da. da. And I told him today I'm going to become a Muslim. And it was silent for a little bit. It was a little bit silent. And what's going through your head when the phone is silent? Man, it was so uncomfortable for me. I was, the silence was so loud. And it was very hard for me to say it, but I was like, I have to. And I'm going to say it to my dad. Like, I love my dad. I respect him. I'm going to tell him. I'm not going to keep this from him. So I told him, and he actually took it very well. Mm. You know, he was, uh, he said, well, you know, if this is what you want to do, it's not going to change the way I feel about you. I still love you. You know, if you ever need anything, I'm always here for you. It's not going to change anything. I love you a lot. It's a lot to process right now, so I'm going to go back to work. But I love you. How long does it take you to talk to them after you take your Shahada? After I took my Shahada, we never really talked about it, to be honest. Okay. Like, I didn't, they never asked me, how is it going being a Muslim? Like, they don't, they didn't ask me too much about it until it came to the point where I was, you know, going to go back home to visit them. Um, my mom more so just asked me, like, is there anything you can't eat or uh, is there anything you can't do or anything? And I just told her, you know, just, I can't have pork, you know, I have to try to eat halal. Um, no alcohol, obviously, no, none of that. But for the most part, you guys don't have to, like, worry about anything. Just try to make sure there's no pork. And try to like make it easy for them so they were very uh open to it and they were accepting and tried to do their best and making me feel okay with it mm. so they're like i was very fortunate with the way my parents acted and you know it didn't change anything yeah like you stepping aside to pray all the stuff that was so okay yeah so uh it's funny because like when, when i was home back home visiting them i had a, it was time to pray and i told my mom i was like i gotta go pray real quick and she's like can i watch like, <laughs> yeah of course so while i was praying you know she was just i could see her standing there just watching me the whole time Maybe yeah the four or five minutes i was praying she was just watching me and what i loved about it was that it encouraged her to now go pray too oh wow she was like you know it just motivated me i should go pray now and she went to go pray you know the her way yeah but it still encouraged her yeah to like be spiritual and like you know do you know to go pray so that made me happy you yeah. know it wasn't she wasn't praying the muslim way or the islam way but it was still like influencing someone to mm. also be more spiritual yeah so yeah. i like that a lot yeah, yeah. no that's that's awesome and then you mentioned this before islam is a very uh like a lifestyle oriented uh religion you know like uh there are no days off in a way where to every day you have to pray every day you have to watch what you eat Every day you have to watch your demeanor, do this, avoid this, avoid that. Um, what has been the hardest adjust adjustment to your lifestyle since you became a Muslim? I think, I think nothing was too hard because I was practicing it before I even reverted. Mm. Um, like praying five times a day was a commitment at first, but once I learned how to pray, I just fell in love with it. Like I look forward to prayers mm. all the time now. Like I don't think it's something that I have to do. It's like something I get to do. It's like a moment I get to step aside from the everyday life stuff. Yeah. And just, you know, just be by myself and connect with God. Mm. And so like the, 
there's not much that was hard right but the only if i'm being honest with you yeah the only thing that like kind of like bummed me out was like that i can't get any more tattoos yeah that was like the only thing because yeah. i always looked at tattoos it was like an art yeah you know, it's just art on my body and i like the way it looked mm -hmm. and i have a few yeah but i'll never get another tattoo yeah you know so that was like the only thing that was like, oh man it kind of <laughs> sucks that it's like i can't get tattoos anymore yeah but other than that man there was not anything else that like that i have temptations for that i want to do that i'm not supposed to do like i said like cutting out all the alcohol the drugs like you know the other things that your body feels be better after you cut that stuff out yeah so much better like mentally sharp like physically healthy like i just there's never a risk of like ruining a relationship because i made a dumb decision while mm -hmm. i was intoxicated like there's so many times where i almost ruined a really good relationship when i was really drunk or you know when i was doing something i wasn't supposed to like there was always a time like every time i would do it it just became a pattern i'm like wow bro like this is bad for me so when I cut it all out, like, like I, I'm telling you, like my life just started going upwards. Yeah. This is, this might be a little personal, but what are Go your ahead. thoughts on marriage after you reverted to Islam or did your thoughts on marriage change at all? I loved what I would hear about it. Mm -hmm. Um, like the, when I would ask about what marriage is like in Islam, I, I liked it. The only thing that's like still hard for me to like, comprehend i guess would be like the no dating yeah you know like you don't date it's more of like you make that commitment obviously me you know you you speak in i mean i mean you, you obviously have to meet the person to yeah, know if you, you like them or like not. that yeah, person yeah. right but it's not like oh let's date for a couple of years mm -hmm. and then you know see if we like it or not yeah. it's like no it's like you meet and if the connection is good you make that commitment it's it like more so like instead of like marrying out of love yeah you're marrying to commit right to become the best husband or wife mm -hmm. for that person and be the best version of yourself and um you know as a husband you, you provide for the family mm -hmm. you know it's like and i love all of that yeah like it makes sense i like it it it's healthy you mm -hmm. know and i think it's like a really good way about going it but for me it's like i'm not thinking about it too much you yeah. know like i want to still focus on my career as of right now yeah but you I think you'll marry an Arab girl? Man, I have no idea. <laughs> I really <laughs> don't. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm open to anything, you know? Yeah. Like, at this point, I've gotten to the point where it's like, it, if it's meant to be, it'll be. Yeah, and course. Allah will guide me. Inshallah. You know, if, inshallah, you know yeah. if I'm supposed to marry an Arab girl, like, alhamdulillah, that would be amazing. Yeah. But, like, as long as what I pray for every morning, one, one of the things I go down is I pray for a wife who is faithful to me and loyal to me who makes me a better Muslim and it reminds me of Allah every day. Those are the three things that I want in my wife. Those are I three beautiful want. things to pray for. That, yeah. Those are the three things I would want. Anything else would be bonus or extra. Shura, what's your dream? Like, you, you know, we're very young, but when you look towards the future, yeah, career wise, family wise, just a person, you know, like when you think of yourself at like 60 or 70, you know, like, we, what's your dream? What do you dream of? What's your, like, if I tell you, what's your wildest dream? Well, my dream in general is to be able to inspire others to also become the best versions of themselves mm -hmm. that they could possibly be. That's something I pray for every day that Allah guides me and puts me on a path to become the best version of myself that he has created me to be. And I also pray that he uses me to inspire those around me to also try to become the best versions mm -hmm. of themselves. Cause I don't think there's anything better than trying to like improve yourself and trying to like be the best version of yourself. I think it's fun. It can be challenging at some sometimes, but the reward is amazing. You know, yeah. when you can like influence someone to be a better person, that is amazing. Yeah. So my dream is to become somebody like that. And whether it's through my career to now, like say like, Career wise, my goal is to be able to build this environment to where creatives can come together, work on an amazing project, an epic project and have fun doing it. It's challenging and stressful, but it's rewarding and it's worth it. Yeah. And also a place where young creatives with no experience can come in and learn and build that experience. Mm -hmm. And everybody just benefits from it, makes money from it, you know, and is able to like live a good life. That's career wise. That's my goal. Yeah. But 
more personally is to become a husband and a, a father who can provide for the family give them whatever they want or need in life and to not ever have to put my family through a situation where they have to struggle financially mm. i would love that that's my goal and that's that's something that motivates me a lot to work hard is to get to that place where my my kids i don't ever have to say no to them mm -hmm. because of a money issue yeah i'm not going to spoil them obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. but the, like saying no isn't because we can't afford it saying no is because it's not the right way to like get something you know Absolutely. you got to work for it, you got to earn it you Absolutely. know i want to teach them that and i think like like you said we're still so young i'm still so young i got to experience so much more in life to be able to become that person mm -hmm. so in my 20s i just want to go through everything bro like yeah. i want to struggle i want to go through hard times i want to know what it's like to really be at the bottom and i want to be able to take it and have this wisdom of being able to now pass it on and teach it to my kids or the people around and to help them and to really like help you know lead my family or guide my family and just like put everybody in a better place yeah that's my that's my dream that, that, that that's a great dream to have thank you um so basically this uh ramadan that's coming up is your first it'll be my Muslim. first one we're having iftar together for sure 100 percent. 100 percent. i would love that <sighs> Thank you, brother. This was uh, very, very nice. It was uh, really a pleasure. The, the story that you just uh, said was, uh, I never heard of it. Like, man, alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm very happy that I get to call you my friend, honestly. Me too. Thank and you, And it's brother. recent too. Yeah. You know, we yes, just sir. recently worked together. And 100%. It's just like, bro, it's been amazing, bro. Yeah. I loved having you around. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Appreciate you. No, I appreciate you.